very warm welcome from Senator McLean and uh, Prime Minister Stewart, United States Secretary General, and the Secretary General of the Commonwealth, uh, as well as uh, Minister Phillips and Minister Mitchell, and uh, my good friend Warren Smith gave us an excellent introduction to what we might discuss later on. And I, I wish to uh, capture a bit the notion that was established this morning, the notion of vibrant societies, and refer specifically to the notion of human development. I am very pleased to see in the title given to Prime Minister Bahamas that we use the expression human development. I've always think that development without qualification is context to be neutral, and what we're really speaking about is human development. And one of the aspects of human development we need to emphasize in order to have our vibrant societies and it was said in various forms with all the present presenters this morning that the three essential strands of that human development are the social, the environmental, and the economic. And elsewhere, I presented them in a sort of a helical fashion. The three of them are intertwined, they all stand separately, and each one buttresses uh, 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 the other. And they, this triple helix of the three, these triple helix supports this human development. And if, as our society, if our societies are to be vibrant, as of the various presenters this morning pointed out, they have to resist the various things and arrows that come our way, and they have to be resilient. And therefore, there has to be social resilience, there has to be environmental resilience, there has to be economic resilience. So if I may begin with Secretary General LaRocque, and said, when we speak of social resilience, we usually refer to the capacity of individuals or groups to be generative in times of stability and reparative after time after uh, uh, shock. And we agree among us, and I was given strict instructions, that it has to be an interactive discussion. So the first part of this, we'll have a discussion among ourselves here, and I guarantee we will leave time for interaction in terms of comments comments, not speeches, on behalf of the, of the, of the, of the, of the audience. Right. Mr. Secretary General, in the your CARICOM strategic plan, which I'm sure you know very well, it sets out some key approaches towards the social resilience. Would you like to give some priority to some of them? And what would you think would be the optimal institutional arrangements for ensuring that social resilience or stimulating such resilience? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, the strategic plan is built on a resilience model that recognizes the interoperability of the main strategic priorities. You mentioned them already: the social, the economic, and the, and the um, environmental. And we've also added the technological um, resilience to that, because that's, that's critical in, in this world. The social, of course, one of the main areas. And again, you've mentioned it: is human development. And we are part of the activities to be undertaken in this is to have a total and thorough review of the thrust of our human capital development in our region, our education system, in particular, in terms of ensuring that we are producing young persons out of our schools, out of our training system that would be well equipped. And I believe um, Minister Fred Mitchell mentioned, mentioned it, well equipped for the, the, the current society and for the world of work, for the world of playing their role in our community development. Of course, you, you need a healthy body in which to have a healthy mind. So then health becomes a critical issue for us. And the issue of, uh, I, I have seen a statistic, may not be as current as I would like, like to have been, but I have seen a statistic that suggests that NCDs, for instance, uh, the cost of NCDs to our economy and to our development is in the region of, on, on average of 4% of GDP. And for some countries, it's much higher, of course, some countries are lower. So there's an economic aspect to it in addition to people, just, you know, people being sick and maladies of illness. So a major aspect of our, our thrust in social development, of course, is the, the health component and addressing uh, NCDs in particular and continuing to address uh, HIV AIDS. And of course, the, the, the factor of inclusiveness in terms of how we go about doing this, the use is critical. Um, the youth uh, in terms of getting the right skill sets in terms of inclusiveness in our society. We heard about the marginalization of young men in the schools, um, but uh, so these, these issues are to The institutional arrangement would require um, 
an integrated policy approach at the national level, and I think that is already happening. And we have to mirror that at the regional level. And that uh, the, the issues of the social impact on the economic and vice versa, and, and hence it has to be that approach, as well as collaboration among the institutions of the community in delivering the, the, the objectives that we have set up. So all our CARICOM institutions and, and our partners of FEMA, our partners in terms of health and in terms of the university education, we have to put together in sort of a board to watch these challenges. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, you have mentioned the various components of the social development. And I am a great fan of the Pakistani economist Abu Bulhak, who points out that health education is also another uh, major component of that, uh, that economy. And if we consider both education and health and how it has to apply, obviously the institution of victory by familiar slavery must have a role. Do you have to comment on that aspect which is as, as you prefer? Okay. Well, uh, yes, George, I think the the critical issue is to, is to recognize that uh, citizens have an interest in, in full participation in, in all aspects of social and economic liberty. And there is, there is a threat in the sense that uh, there can be external factors impacted on how a citizen participates in self-reliance. Uh, and there are also internal factors. The internal factors such as when citizens uh, withdraw their enthusiasm, around citizenship, uh, when citizens uh, devalue the importance of citizenship and how they act in response to promoting their own self interest So I believe that, that while we look at the, the economic participation of the citizens, we also have to focus on the social process of the citizens because they are so, they are so interactive. You cannot be a good economic actor in society unless you're also a good social actor. And I think that dialectical relationship is what the SG is for. Yeah, I am so pleased to hear you refer to citizen security uh, as being essential. And to have that, that security has different dimensions. And not to think only in terms of the judiciary and law and order and repression, etc., the state ability to impose law and order on us or, 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 or secure law and order for a size. So I'm, very, I'm going to come back to that aspect again. That other dimension of citizens, I'm going to come back to that again. But human development is the crux of the 2015 agenda, and this was mentioned over and over uh, 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 again. Ahmed Mohammed has had a tremendous role to play in articulating these uh, 70 sustainable development goals. And also, she's been very cognizant, of this, as she has said, that the, uh, the six, the smaller developing states, their agenda has been intricately interwoven with the 70 sustainable development goals. Given the congruence between the SIDS agendas and the SDGs, in his speech in Samoa, Prime Minister Stewart could call for a SIDS collectivity, a SIDS collectivity, and he asked the UN system to assist in developing it. How would you, from your position uh, of influence in the UN, see such a collectivity uh, enhancing the operationalization of the SDGs and promoting social resilience. Would like to comment on that, Mr. Hamid? Yes, thank you, Mr. George. It's a really important part of the discussion right now. We can see that the whole process is really engaged in underneath the SIDS, and, and we can see a reflection of that quite clearly in the goals that we have today. I think the question now is the conversation we have on the implications of the implementation of this agenda and what it really means. And I think the initiative um, that Prime Minister Stuart talks about in terms of the collectivity is a really important part of discussing issues that look to the strengths that we have in diversity, where we've got mutual interests, we've got mutual challenges, and how we come as a collective to try to address those, um, both from an individual but a collective uh, responsibility. It also makes for, um, I think, putting down uh, many investments that we see in the longer term as irreversible gains. And the, the point of the Sustainable Development Agenda is how we look at that from the inside out and that we're not just taking on things and trying to absorb them, but really having um, a, a role to play in, in when we're leading, really having that conversation. Um, I think that the collectivity itself um, in, in concept also helps us to deal with the transition. 
uh, from a mindset conceptually that we've looked at with the MDGs that really dealt with one part of the agenda, the social part, to try to talk about integration and universality from the local level to the global level. And, and using really as much as possible we can to get the assets we have with the regional. How does that help us in the transition? This will not happen overnight. There are many things that were pointed out today that need to happen locally, but that we need to ensure in the partnerships that we should be shaping, not just be uh, receiving um, uh, um, on, on, that, on that part. Um, the key elements that I think that uh, can be seen through this connectivity and what we would need to do as a, a global partner to make sure this happens is right from the onset beginning to look at alignments that we need to have within our policy frameworks across um, the, the countries that we have, but also with the kind of development challenges that we know cannot be done uh, alone. I mean, we talk about this, there are also the alignments that need to happen with our partners across regions. Um, local accountability. That's also another, I think, um, conceptually we need to define that. It's being defined from us at a global level. I think that conversation we need to happen. Local and global accountability, how do we bring that into the fore and define it better? I think it has been defined almost with a stick that's pointed in one direction and how can we reflect that much better in our work. I think that there is also, um, again, the, the, the collectivity that we would have in uh, strengthening our institutions. We've all talked about the capacity gaps that we have to engage. I often say that on the floor of the General Assembly in New York, that's the place that you really see inequality. You're expected to be those that need the most in a partnership, and yet you have the least muscle at the table to communicate, to, to negotiate, uh, to get the best that we can out of it. So institutions from, um, from our countries, but also across um, into regions and into global, global places. Um, I heard very strongly in this, um, as I spoke to the SDGs in the Forum for the Future um, of the Caribbean in Trinidad, a number of things that I think help make us fit for purpose, because that has to have a conversation in country, it has to have a conversation within constituencies. I heard you talk just now about citizens. Um, we, I started using citizens and very quickly stopped and people made me understand that there are millions of people who are no longer citizens because uh, of the migration issue, because of various conflict um, and humanitarian issues, the, the natural disasters that we have. Um, so I think these, these four points I would say need to be taken. Voices, how can we capture voices and what do we mean when we talk about youth? and their participation in this. And not to forget the other side of the coin, which is the wisdom. <coughs> there is nothing that doesn't come well from history. And I think we we'll often talk about learning lessons. I'm not sure that we do because we keep repeating the mistakes. So how do we get that intergenerational partnership between those that are handling the baton and those expected to run with it? I think that conversation really must happen. A deep reflection within our societies, if we want to make this sustainable, how do we really look at the tensions between the livelihoods that we're trying to be out, and the lifestyles we're trying to attain, which are not necessarily our bar. A bar that we look outside to, but actually is not sustainable. And those have to change in the pathways that we, we speak to today. Um, I think the results must be clear. What results do we expect? And how can we expect those results that really leave no one behind? And they give people a life of dignity. I think leaving no one behind goes back to that data revolution that we need. We don't even know where people are. So when we begin to start our plans, we haven't got the disaggregated data to know really how to face the Minister of Finance and say, this is the kind of plan that we need and the investments we need to, to move with. But that life of dignity, defining what it means for you um, as people um, within a country but across a country and, and trying to get um, that life of dignity. When dignity is taken away from people, anything goes. The challenges and the complexities we have with people who move out of our countries or who perhaps remain to become disruptive in our countries, there has to be a reason for it. We're not born disruptive. And I think that you know the root causes of many of these things is an opportunity that the sustainable development agenda gives us. And I think you know in the end, that's the litmus test, is the implementation of this, the alignments between what we've all participated in. But in the end, this transition to getting it right, to getting it right as, as a country, as a people, and a region. Thank you very much. I mean, a couple of things, of everything you said uh, uh, resonated with me. But the point about accountability resonated with me particularly. I think we're going to come back to that. Who is accountable to whom for what? Uh, we can return if they more deeply into these points raised. But as we noted, <coughs> several people made the point very clearly. Warren Smith articulated it very. Brilliantly, that critical.
political environmental strand or helix. It's almost inseparable. It touches everything. And so if you're going to have vibrant societies, we need to take account of the, not the environment, but the relationship of the environment. And so this notion of the environmental resilience is very much at the heart of many of the concerns of the cities. It was an integral part of the Barbados program of action. And I would ask you, Dr. Nurse, does that notion have any special characteristics for the Caribbean at this time? And how would you seek in the Caribbean at this time to achieve this environmental resilience? Well, thank you, um, Mr. George. I think um, what has been indicated very clearly this morning in many of the presentations is the very close nexus between environmental sustainability, livelihoods, quality of life, and those kinds of indices. I think those are critical indices. And therefore, your question has particular relevance to us as it did as far back as the time of the Wetland Commission because many of the marketable goods and services we produce are in fact based on environmental resources. And it is for this reason that we need to find a more efficient way of bringing the value of our environmental goods and services into our national accounting system. So for example, when we pollute or lose an acre of coral reef, what does that mean in dollar terms? What does it mean in livelihood terms? How many fishers, how many dependents are disenfranchised um, because of those losses? And therefore, it is for that reason that we must therefore bring into the mix issues relating to things like poverty alleviation, access to clean water, affordable food, energy and access to health care and so on, must be part of the package of resilience building. Because if we marginalize certain sections of society, and if they feel not apart because of poverty and so on, then they have absolutely no um, option but to turn to the environmental resources and use them, in many cases, irresponsibly. I take, for example, the case of land clearance and deforestation. People don't deforest the lands and clear the lands because they're wicked. They do it because they need fuel for firewood. They do it because they need food and they have to grow food and so on. So until we find um, some options for them that are sustainable, then that is part of the process that we need to look at very carefully. Otherwise, our environmental um, sustainability is going to be undermined. And I think, therefore, that this demands a sort of paradigm shift away from the way we do business. And while this has been said, on many occasions before, I think we have to begin thinking about scales, the way we function. Scale is a very important part of environmental and social and economic resilience. We need to think more about achieving um, longer term sustained benefits from our environmental resources rather than short term things. And while, of course, it is important and necessary for us to speak to present day current needs of society, health care, food, shelter, and so on, there is a way in which we can do that and achieve all of those without degrading the environmental resources. And therefore, I think the issue raised about environmental sustainability and resilience is very, very relevant to the Caribbean because of the peculiar socioeconomic realities that we face, low productivity levels, um, we are caught in the middle income trap, um, we are prone to severe natural hazards, and more critically is the fact that almost everything we produce, almost everything we earn for an exchange and revenues from is really based on the importance of our environmental resources. And let me just finish Sir George by suggesting that there is a difference in my judgment between being able to cope and being resilient. I think rebounding aftershocks, we do things that allow us to cope. So for example, we may go and reconstruct in the same vulnerable locations after a major um, hazard, such as a storm or a hurricane. But the important thing is that we, 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 we need to make sure that all of the actions we take are not just simply coping strategies 
but there are strategies designed to build long-term resilience. And I think there's an important distinction between the two, which I hope we can develop later on. Thank you very much, Dr. Nurse. You go back to the original Rutland Commission, in which one of our distinguished part, Caribbean citizens participated in Sunny Ramphal, pointed out what we must do to preserve these things. Another point you made, is I, I hope our audience takes account of, you mentioned environmental hazards. And I've been told that the disaster is when we have not coped well with the hazard. So really, hazard, we should not speak of environmental disasters. That is reflected on ourselves and our inability to cope. But they really, it's environmental hazard, the disaster comes and we can. We haven't dealt with it properly with it. And never mind. Uh, I was taught that earlier on. Uh, with these environmental and social shocks that the Caribbean has undergone and have threatened our economies for so time, uh, we have found the look for various means to strengthen our capacity to re resist in the short or long term. Uh, uh, Minister Boyce, we've had <coughs> considerable discussion about not only the goals, but how do you implement them. And uh, Secretary General Sham referred to some of these means, how do you implement them? How do you implement these proposals, such as the Barbados Plan, the Samoa Pathway, when they do come about the Sustainable Development Goals? And we cite often the official development assistance, mobilization of local resources, innovative sources of financing. But from where you sit, both in the cabinet area and as chairman of the Caribbean Commission, how do you see these means of implementation? Thank you, Sir George. I think that we have to consider all three sorts of finance and implementation mechanisms. And I'm going to find the ODA as concessional financing, long-term, low-rate concessional financing, because which will include both bilateral and multilateral um, financing. And the sorts of mechanisms we, we use depend upon the areas we are going to focus on. Lena has just mentioned the matter of the coping with environmental problems that have already begun to occur in the region because of the rising temperature and the rising sea levels. That is a situation that has occurred through no fault really of the Caribbean or Caribbean nations. And it's happening not only in the Caribbean but throughout the more and developing states. And that sort of work, which is essentially just preserving, just trying to preserve the income that we now have, we now get from our, say from, from our beaches and from the seas, that is a sort of, the sort of project, the sort of approach that needs to have for the attack assistance. Because it really doesn't add anything more to what we will produce. It just helps us to, re, to stay in the same place. We're running to keep, keep on the same spot. That needs specialized, We're concessional, long-term, low-income financing. The areas of health and education and, and, and issues of, issues of citizen security. Once again, are areas that help us just to maintain where we are, enable us to, to continue to be services economies. In most instances, we're good services economies. Even if we're resource-based economies, enable us to have the level of skills that we need to run a resource-based economy using our, our people, again, the benefits of our people. That sort of uh, program is the one where bilateral, where concessional financing is ultimately required. The areas are where we plan to remove constraints on our economy. For example, many of our islands are water scarce islands. And, and it's not only for the Caribbean islands, it's just we've got a small and developing states are water scarce. We have to find ways of removing that constraint if we are going to deal with the growth that, that, that we need to go forward with. And therefore, this is about exploring the blue, Asia, uh, um, the, the blue, the blue strategy, the ocean strategy. It's going to be based on concessional financing because largely, much of it is, is untried, much of it is untested, and the ones that have been tested not sufficiently, so maybe we have to have concessional financing to give us the opportunity to explore those, explore those, those areas. And then the whole area of what what areas do we have growth in in the short in the short term? Many of those areas in, in, in fact tie into the environment, preserving the environment, service treatment systems. 
just to preserve what to preserve the quality of the water, the water resources around and within the countries. Those are areas that need concession finance. And chair, we have to get concession financing also for debt management issues. Because the level of our debt, large large because we've been forced very often to go go to the to, to raise debt in the commercial markets is such that we have that we are fast losing space to do the things that governments are required to do. The health services, the educational services, the sanitation services. Because we are paying very high interest rates very often or, 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 or on short or medium term lending. That to, in order to be able to free up some fiscal space to maintain, so just to maintain the, the level of social services, which keeps our people uh, reasonably happy, reasonably uh, productive, needs to, us to get be able to reprofile that debt, reprofile it with lower cost funds, reprofile it for longer periods of time so that we, are, we can squeeze the fiscal space out to do the, the critical things in the society. And we can't grow the, our societies, our economies, unless we grow, unless we improve our social systems. We can, we can talk, we can grow all we like. If we don't have the social systems in place, if we don't have the environmental systems in place, we actually are only going to condemn ourselves to short one growth and to escalate the problems that we're going to have later on. I think I'll rest here. Thank you very much. I've been very bad, moderator. I just assume that this. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, so well known and even have been used them. So let me correct Aaron my ways and begin with Secretary General uh, Rock, Secretary General Comrade uh, of the, Com uh, the CARICOM, uh, Henry Beckles, who is the Vice Chancellor University of the West Indies, Mr. Mina Mohammed, who is the UN Secretary General's Special Advisor on post 2015 Development Planning, and Dr. Levin Nurse who comes from the University of West Indies from our Center for Resource Management and Environmental Studies. And she, he will be followed by Ms. Alicia Barsena, who is the Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC. And last but not least is our new Secretary General of the OIS, uh, His Excellency Mr. Luis Armarco. So I should have done that in the beginning. I've corrected error of my ways. Now if we may pass to Ms. Barsena. Ms. Barsena, it is not enough to respond to episodic crisis, there has to be some uh, longer term approach uh, 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 to this. So let me put it to you this way. If we accept, as everyone has said, that macroeconomic stabilization is the key to long term growth in the Caribbean, what are the tools for government to uh, achieve this macroeconomic stabilization? And one of the things that was mentioned by Dr. Smith and others is our debt. Caribbean nations are heavily in debt. Can we realistically grow our way out of this debt, or are there other alternatives you would wish to suggest? Thank you very much for your question, and I'm very happy to be here this morning. I want to say that the first thing I, I guess I would like to, to bring to the table is, what does the Caribbean need to do? And then we, I'll come to, you, to your question. First of all, I think there's a change of paradigm this year, and we have to take advantage of it. Let me put the three or four questions on this change of paradigm. We have to move from the culture of privilege to the culture of equality. Too much privileges, that is, tax exemptions, tax concessions, I don't know what, privilege, no. We have to move from that culture. Second one, we have to move from extractivism to sustainability. We have been very much relying on our primary resources, extractivism, rentism, and the third one is how do we distribute rents from capital to labor and how do we do this and focus on the real economy. And here's my friend Winston Dukeran with whom we have been working the structural approaches of ECLAC which is we need equality as a driver of growth. Equality. As a driver of growth. It's not going to be the end product. It has to be the driver. We need these people that are emerging out of poverty to become the engine of growth and the growth for equality, of course. And then, of course, we need productivity. That's number one problem in the Caribbean and in the, the whole of Latin America. Well, how do we do that? We need to move from consumption and export, by the way. Trade is in trouble. 
serious trouble. Trade all, all over the world is declining. So we have to go for investment. Now, here comes your question. If we have to go for investment, and we have to mobilize, uh, as, as they say in Addis Abeba, domestic resources, we can't do that in Caribbean countries. It's not possible for the following reason, and that is to come into your question. We have, you know, of the 20 high indebted countries in the world, five are from the Caribbean. And this is the problem. Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Grenada, Jamaica, St. Kitts and Nevis. These are the top five. Nobody talks about them. We all hear about Greece. Nobody hears about the Caribbean. Come on. Of course, it represents 1% of the global burden of, of debt. So we are not a systemic problem. And that's number one. I mean, the, the Caribbean, if we go for a debt reduction for the Caribbean, we're not going to cause any kind of systemic global problem, believe me. So, the, so my point is that the, the whole of the debt uh, in the Caribbean is $46 billion. Much of this debt has been acquired because of natural disasters. The cost of natural disasters has been $30 billion in the Caribbean between, let's say, 1990 and last year. So most of this debt, 48, we're talking 30, due to natural hazards. It's not because the Caribbean is not organized or macroeconomically prudent. It's because it's very vulnerable. And it has uh, insularities and, and a lot of problems. So the, the thing is, an FDI is declining. And then the Caribbean is coming into a very, I would say, vicious circle in which the, the, the premium of the risk premium is growing because you have to go to the market uh, to, to look for capital in the market at market rates because we don't have concessional funding because we are middle income countries, you know? So this has to be cut off. And here is a proposal. We believe that the Caribbean really can be, uh, uh, that we should work together. And this comes from the Commonwealth ideas, by the way, and the CDB. We are not inventing anything. The only thing we are trying to do is to put it together in a single proposal. That's what we're doing. And this means the following. You see, the, 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 the multilateral debt, of the, total, of the total external debt of the Caribbean, 40% is multilateral and 14 is bilateral. Now, the multilaterals have never been write-off, have never gone for a write-off. Well, it's time for them to go for one, don't you say? And we really, I mean, and, and we have here, so, and, and I have discussed this preliminary with my friends of the IMF. With the World Bank. I, don't, I don't mean to say that we have the solution, but we have to sit together and work this out. This is the year to do this. And if we haircut the multilateral external debt, we're talking about the 40%. 14 is bilateral. The rest is private. So I'm, I'm only going to refer to the multilateral. But look, why is this so important, George, if I may tell you? Please. My dear, because we know each other for many years. <laughs> and, <laughs> don't we? I mean, don't we? Yeah. And, and I am totally for this, and I actually, I politically want the support of the prime ministers because I think if we, if we, if we engage in this together, we're going to make it. Look how much is happening here. In 2013, external debt service payments absorbed 10% of the receipts on exports of goods and services. 58% of the revenue were as high as 58%. Only for the debt uh, uh, service payments. And then 27% of government revenue. I mean, we're talking here about social programs, education. Where on earth these governments are going to get the money if we don't move towards a opening up the fiscal space? Now, and here, I really believe that we have to move into a gradual, gradual write-off of the multinational debt, which will open up a, a very important fiscal space. Now, what do we do with that write-off? The debt service payments should go to a resilience fund, you know, with local currency. A resilience fund that can probably be managed, with my friend from the CDB, by the Caribbean Development Bank. Where is he? He left? Oh, ah, no, don't leave. Because the resilience fund, I should go there. And that resilience fund should be used for what? For infrastructure, for adaptation, see the fence. Uh, what are you needing in terms of, of, of roads, infrastructure, 
for adaptation. That would be my, my suggestion. Then, another fund that is extremely important, I will end up here, I promise, is that we need a external, uh, I would say, macroeconomic uh, fund. Now, that fund is for external shocks. Who should support that external macroeconomic fund? Is the large economies of Latin America. Come on. The Brazil, the Mexico, the Colombians should stand behind and create a funding mechanism that can protect from external shocks. Because uh, when you have external shocks in the Caribbean, you have to go to the market. That's not helpful at all. So, bottom line, uh, uh, dear friends, we have here a proposal that we want to share with you. It's not finished. It has to be worked. It has to be developed. We have to sit down, IMF, the World Bank. We need to be the, the, the multilaterals. We also need the donors, and we need the countries. And we have to work this out together. And we want this mandate coming out from Addis Ababa. It's the only way out. The Caribbean will not make it unless there is a debt reduction strategy and unless there is real movement towards what? Increased productivity, investment, and of course, I, my favorite topic, which is structural change in the productive structure for equality. Thank you. Thank you very much. One of my favorite philosophers, Hegel, always said, nothing is achieved without passion. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's a little admirable. The vulnerability of SIDS, in this case, the Caribbean countries have been argued repeatedly. What action do you think the OAS, or Central American states, uh, can take in terms of these economic vulnerabilities? What can the OAS do? Because uh, we have uh, been talking about this uh, for nine long months of political campaign to become Secretary General. <laughs> and, uh, we, came, uh, we came here and we promised many things. Some of them related to the issues that uh, my dear friend next to me is, uh, has mentioned. But uh, for me, the, the key issue always where to start that is, uh, of course, uh, is, uh, you know our uh, new logo, no? our, our new leitmotiv for the realization of American experience. More rights for more people. That means that we center. We don't, we don't have in the realization of American states anything that can multiply the GDP of any country. But uh, in fact, we have seen that nobody has. The only way to move forward is providing rights to the people. That means housing, that means health, that means education, and to make them equal. And that is the biggest point about the law. You have societies that have big economies, big GDPs, big GDPs per capita, and they are underdeveloped because rights issues have not fixed, have not been fixed properly. And that is the cornerstone where we have to be. This, this every, every single issue, crisis, you have a crisis. What do the people think? The, the people want you to resolve, to hold the middle class, not to be able to, to end in a slum in the middle of, uh, of nowhere. You have to keep them in their houses. You have to keep them assisted by in education in health. These things are the key issues for, the, for development. And then, yeah, we come to, to these stories, uh, this stories here because uh, protection of rights only comes from a strong society, from clever societies, I would say, but from a strong society. A weak society will never be able to protect their rights properly because it requires a lot of dialogue, a lot of understanding, a lot of commitment to bring the issues of the people to the main, as the main and most important issues of the agenda. And then we have environment that you have, that is, like a macroeconomic control, environment control, environment efficiency, is a cross country issue. And so that's why we need, uh, uh, but that we, are, we cannot work it alone. What we see here, what we see here, uh, countries uh, in Latin America and Caribbean, we see countries that they don't have a scale. 
for example, in climate change, about climate change, your problems are very big and your economies are very small. And what is, where the problems come from countries that their risk is very low and their economies are very big. So to make them understand requires a very, a very clever international society that doesn't exist so far because the climate change issue, like all environmental issues, the global issues, they need somebody to pay the bill. <coughs> and those that they have to pay the bill, she found uh, our, my fellow Latin American countries, big Latin American countries, to pay the bill for. <laughs> for the, but I think the global, the global economies, the big global economies, they have to pay the bill about climate change. Definitely, they have to pay that bill. They are in charge of that bill. They are in charge of the bill of the debt of, of many developing countries. That's uh, true. The shops come and go, and, <clears throat> and that can be a part of the, of the question always. But there has to be something that can be able to fix these issues in a more reliable manner, manner to, say, to say the least. Uh, I, can leave, uh, I can leave here, um, but uh, there are many things. We, we have to engage in a... Uh, in, uh, in serious solutions. These serious solutions, they come country from country and dealing with each person, each people that we know, that we, we work with, that uh, are connected to us for a solution. Every people, I said, I said when I, when I assume, assume duties in the Organization for America, I am the poorest of the poorest. I am the most silent of those that they don't have a voice. I am the repressed that it is under oppression and cannot speak or cannot have a political speech. I am the one that has to provide the rights to those people. And that is the issue about this matter. And economy is something that uh, my dear friend Winston Duke and I'm very much quoted today, trying to link the economic logic with the political logic. If you don't do that, you don't, we are not able to provide rights to people, you are not able to provide development, you are not able to provide more facilities. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency. Uh, one point I would point out though, in no way did this person speak of the big countries paying the bill. That was not her point. I just want to get it across. Yeah, she did not yeah, articulate yeah. that point. Oh, yes, yes. Let me come back. Let me come back to Senator Mr. Laurent, Ambassador Laurent. Uh, the position put forward by Ms. Barcelona of debt uh, relief, is this one uh, the Caribbean community, you think, would work together uh, to advance this in the appropriate forum? Of course it would be. Um, the whole issue of fiscal diplomacy, and uh, we've already begun to work in that area, um, not only in terms of debt, but in terms of um, uh, addressing the issue of access to development financing and the whole issue of um, being categorized as middle income. And we've had a successful history of that. We've worked along with, with the Commonwealth, we've worked along with others, and it's something that we just have to, to tackle head on. Uh, I, I think I like Alicia's proposal very much in terms of resolving the, uh, the, the multilateral debt, debt and putting it into a, a short of fund or various funds. And as, as has been said constantly, our region has been in a, in a constant for about since 2007, 2008, whether it be economic, whether it be, whether it be natural disasters, they just keep piling up one after the other. And, and the model of being in a period of growth and an intermittent shock and so on is one that is not adequately describe our model of at this point in time. The, the realities have changed. So I think I have latched on to this. I think it's something we, we need to work on together. And I, 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 I suspect that we could get all the partners uh, to join us in this. Minister. And if you're in the cabinet, and you're going to say this is an issue that we as a country should have a debt relief and work towards it, is that a reasonable proposition? I shouldn't say that. So, but I'll ask, is that a reasonable proposition? Well, I think it is. It would be a very reasonable proposition. I think it's a, it's a necessary, a necessary proposition. proposition. And of course, how you do that, that relief is going to be important because you don't want to do it in a way that then prejudices you from getting funds in the future. So it's going to be a matter of negotiation and discussion. But it has has to come. I mean, my friend here mentioned 40% my 
minority landlords, 14% by landlords, but at least 46% that is commercial. And, and it strikes me that the rates of the rates that are on commercial debt, that there is perhaps more opportunity there, or as much opportunity there, to do some renegotiation. If you can get the multilaterals to stand behind you and help you to them to take over that debt at their, at their low rates on their long their long terms, or perhaps with some grants. But that's, that's going to be a negotiation that has to take place. Mm -hmm. so therefore, 46% of your debt is on commercial terms. Then you've got to deal with that commercial debt. Straight numbers suggest that that has to be, has to be dealt with. Yeah. The rest of it can be negotiated, I think. But the negotiation has to be done in a way that will not spoil your credit rating going forward, even though you may not intend to go back to the commercial markets too soon, you still need to leave the door open sufficiently that if you have to go there, you can get there. Okay. There's a two-pronged approach you're proposing. When I come back to uh, Professor Beckel, who is an economic historian, in case you don't know, and has some knowledge of these matters. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I, and I, I, I thank you for invoking the historical perspective. It's important because most of our country has become independent uh, just over 50 years in the English-speaking sub-region, 100 years in the Spanish-speaking area. But uh, we have to face the fact that when we, when we entered the nation-building process and, and a structured way, and a constitutional way, we also inherited some of the colonial debt that was passed on. And we have to, we have to understand that, I think, to know that many of these nations started their journey into nation building with an inherited colonial debt and a propensity to carry that debt. What I believe our governments have been doing since the 1960s and 70s, and I have used the expression uh, more than once, that we have really been cleaning up the colonial mess. Now, let's assume that we have been cleaning up the colonial mess. Many of our governments have spent an enormous amount of money on health, education, infrastructure, just to turn, just to turn these colonies into living spaces. Because the fact is that when we inherited them at independence, they were not, they were not suitable for living a civil democratic life. They were colonies, and I think we might have pushed ourselves very far into an expenditure schedule to create for the citizens a, a living place. And a, a fair share of the domestic debt has to do with the cleaning up the health problem eradicated illiteracy, uh, removing the ghettos from our societies, and governments did uh, generate a significant domestic debt in that regard. So on the external front, I, I do agree with that, which is why uh, in the CARICOM Reparations Commission, in the 10-point plan which we have asked the heads to approve, one of the points in that plan is the elimination of the external debt. Uh, and that is one of the issues that we have framed in there as a process of reparatory justice. Because let's face the facts, um, globalization is a double-edged sword. On, on the one hand, it speaks to, to openness, uh, to, to level playing fields. But the fact is that when you look at the politics of globalization and the economics of globalization, they are going in different directions. It is about rich nations versus weak nations. It's a, it's a conflict between powerful nations and, and weak nations. And there is a transfer of resources out of the smaller, weaker nations into the rich and powerful nations. And this is what globalization is. This is why we have this conflict between the political rhetoric of globalization and the economic reality of it, which is a transfer of value out of the poor, vulnerable countries into the sustainable developed countries. And the debt is also a part of that process. Now, we, we speak oftentimes about the importance of equity and equality. And we heard Secretary General speaking about the importance of equity and equality. It's, it's an interesting philosophy. It's a great concept. But the fact is that if that idea of equity and equality emerges out of Western discourse, the fact is that the powerful nations of the West do not believe in it. So it's a beautiful rhetorical tool within the traditions of philosophy and so on. But in the practice of the economic relationship, the notion of equality between the powerful nations and the weaker nations, it is, it is not practiced. So 
we are fighting to bring realistic validity to the meaning of equality and the politics of equality. And this is something that we have to win. And I certainly hope that in these conversations we say to the developed countries, you speak the rhetoric of equality, we need a political engagement of equality. And we want the reality of it implemented within world relations. I, 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 I buy your hair and buy your, your art.